In 1350, what we know as the idyllic French countryside was a living hell. For more than 15 years, the people had suffered at the hands of English invaders. Little did they know that this war would last for another 100 years. But through this crucible of fighting, famine and plague, there would emerge the modern nation of France. England's king, Edward III, looked jealously across the English Channel. Wanting France for his own, he had added the fleur de lis, the symbol of France, to his own royal standard. This was an all-out declaration of war. And in 1337, he invaded. But France already had a king, Philippe VI. As the English burned their way across the land, Philippe's army and his legendary knights marched to meet them and came face to face with the English longbow. A simple weapon, but the most devastating the knights had ever faced. The heroes of France fell to storms of English arrows. The war engulfed the French countryside. By 1351, the conflict was focused on Brittany. One fight stands out as a spectacular display of chivalry and a symbol of the wider conflict between the two enemy nations. The combat of the Thirty is still commemorated here in Brittany. It was a dispute between two local families. Supported by the opposing sides in the war, the French and English commanders decided to settle it through a trial of knightly combat. Each side would choose 30 champions to fight on neutral ground. France prepared to defend itself against England's finest. Intent on ending the suffering of the French peasantry, Sir Jean de Beaumanoir sent a challenge to the English commander. 30 champions on each side would compete in a tournament for final claim to Brittany. With the battleground of the halfway oak agreed upon, Sir Jean set out to gather support from local knights. As a knight himself, Sir Jean followed the strict rules of chivalry and was expected to protect the local peasantry and ensure peace. Most medieval tournaments were friendly in nature, held for sport and glory, but the combat of the Thirty was arranged between opponents mired in war. English raids had torn through the countryside of Brittany and brought great hardship to the people. Sir Jean spotted an English raiding party attacking a nearby farmstead.
the French knights defeated the English raiders, and Sir Guy de Rochefort joined Sir Jean's party. Sir Jean's search next brought him to Sir Geoffroy de Bois, whose squires were contending with a detachment of English longbowmen. The knights would use the great speed of their war horses to charge the archers and overwhelm them. The English longbowmen fell, but the French knights knew the enemy would attempt to retake the hilltop fortification and steeled themselves for further attacks. With Sir Geoffroy by his side, Sir Jean had secured the outpost. Looking to secure his honor, a young knight held his ground on a bridge in Sir Jean's path. Honorably conceding defeat in the duel, Sir Yves Charel joined the cause. Hey, comprends. Sir Jean entered the staging area for the tournament, where he prepared to choose which knights would join him in battle. Each knight would be accompanied by his squires, young nobles in training to become knights themselves. So Jean had selected his champions. As the sun rose, the two sides entered the arena, ready for the first round of combat.
claiming an easy victory in the first round, the French champions left the arena to recover their strength. Refreshed and reinvigorated, the French knights return to the arena for another round of combat. The combat of the 30 was about to decide which nation would control the Duchy of Brittany. Triumphant, Saint Jean de Beaumanoir and his loyal knights claimed victory. The combat of the Thirty had decided control of Brittany in favor of the French. Little did the two sides know, this was just the beginning of a bitter war that would outlive them all. In the Hundred Years' War, the English used a terror tactic, a raid through enemy territory intended to intimidate and provoke the French into battle. It was called Chevauchet. The principal weapon for Chevauchet was fire. And one of the ways it was delivered was with incendiary arrows. Challenge with incendiary arrows? Keeping them alight. One type of incendiary arrow was fueled with gunpowder. We've got charcoal, we've got sulfur, and we've got saltpeter. Saltpeter is the main ingredient. The more oxygen you put into it, the hotter it burns. Of course, when it's on an arrow, when it's being shot, you've got a turbocharged airstream. The chemicals are bound together with brandy, left to dry, and poured into a linen bag. The extra long arrowhead is inserted into the bag and then tied off to secure it. It is then sealed by dipping it into boiling tree resin. This resin, which itself is highly flammable, provides a waterproof casing. It also shields the burning gunpowder so the wind doesn't put it out in flight. Now that looks deadly and I really want to shoot it. The art to shooting an incendiary arrow is timing. Too early and it will go out. Too late, it will spit at you like a dragon. That was just evil, <laughs> that was great. The word chevauchet means horse raid, and it was mobile light horsemen who spearheaded the attacks. They took gold and silver from the churches, valuables from wealthy citizens, and as much food and drink as they could find from anyone. 
a cheviche was scorched earth warfare to create discontent amongst the enemy's subjects, perhaps even to get them to turn against their king. An army on campaign needed a decisive battle. And a cheviche was intended to taunt the enemy to come out and fight.